Ooh. Oh, it might be beautiful in this snow, but it's still hard to find compositions. And it's one of the things that everybody asks me about. So what I want to do is tell you seven ways that you can massively improve your compositional skills. So I'm gonna go back to the studio where it's a bit warmer and tell you more about it. Here we go. so cold out there. It's great to see you all again. In this video, I'm gonna talk all about composition. It's a video that I've wanted to do for so long. I'm gonna give you seven simple ways to improve your composition in landscape photography. Okay, let's get started. So all amazing photos have good composition. Whilst I don't think it's the thing that makes my portfolio grade images, I think light is. I think without good composition, those images would fall down, they wouldn't be great at all, they'd just be a capture of that scene and wouldn't have that extra something special to them. So getting composition right is really important, but it's actually one of the things that most people struggle with the most. So on my workshops, it's the thing that everybody wants to know, how do you come up with a good composition? And what I want to do today is go through the fundamentals of what I've used over the years to come up with these photos and some of the tips and tricks that I use to compose my images. I'm sure you've all been there where you've looked at an image when you've got back into Lightroom and thought, oh, why don't I just move a little bit to the right or to the left? And one of the really important things in, in composition is, is be able to use these techniques whilst you're taking the photo so that when you do get back to Lightroom, you're just making small changes to it rather than cropping right in or thinking, oh, this photo is just not gonna work because I, I wasn't low enough, I wasn't high enough, I should have included this extra tree or whatever. So by following some of these simple techniques, you'll be able to improve your photography. What we're trying to do with this, what is composition? So composition is how everything comes together in the image. So how the sky interacts with the land, how the trees are positioned in the image, how the light interacts with those trees, how you reproduce the feeling of that image. And it's how all that comes together in the image to produce that final photo that tells the story of when you were there. Now there's obviously rules that we can follow like the rules of thirds, the golden ratio, and things like that. And I will briefly mention those, but there's cleverer ways that you can go about composing an image and that's what I want to go through today. Okay, let's get into the first point and that is how do I look for a composition? So how do you go about looking for a composition when you arrive at a scene? So the first thing to do is don't rush. Obviously light might be changing, you need to sometimes get a move on, but the best photos come when you take your time, you explore the area before you get your camera out. Now, what I do is use my iPhone and I look through my iPhone as I'm wandering around the scene and that allows me to frame it. That helps me to see the scene a little bit differently and not rush to get my main camera out. I might take some photos with my iPhone as well. Now, when I finally found something I think is gonna be interesting, then I'll get my camera out I'll still not put it on its tripod and I'll try and compose something. When I've found exactly what lens I'm gonna use, where I'm gonna compose that image, then I'll get my tripod out and set it up. So the next thing to do is, is find a point of interest. So find something that you think, well, this is what I'm gonna photograph. Now that point of interest doesn't necessarily have to be a thing. In this image it is, it's the sheep in the, in, in the image. And that point of interest was something that then I framed the image around. When I first was attracted to this scene, it was the sunset that got me going. So I thought, God, look at that sunset. But I had to find something to anchor that sun sunset, a point of interest in that sunset. So I looked for a point of interest, which was this opening in this wall, and then the sheep came through, and that's how I composed this image. Now that point of interest is really important when you're trying to look for a composition. So that's the first thing to do, find a point of interest. Think about then how you're gonna track the attention of the viewer to that point of interest. So in this case, with the sheep again, it was the wall. I, I include the bottom of this wall that sweeps around into the sheep, which I placed right smack bang in the center of the image, which breaks quite a lot of compositional rules, but actually works really well for this, this particular image. And the other thing to think when you're thinking about that point of interest is, is that it might not always be a thing like these sheep or a wall or a tree. It might just be an area of the image that you want to attract the viewer's attention to. So for instance, in this shot that I shot in Yosemite, I was again attracted to the light and the beautiful mountains, but I couldn't really find a, a, an individual thing within this 
shot that that really would attract the viewer's attention. So what I decided was that the, the background of it, the, the layers that, that were right in the sort of top left corner of this image were the thing that were really powerful in the image and that was what was my point of interest. And I tried to anchor that point of interest and, and create focus on that point of interest by using the light, the diagonal lines of the light cast across the um, rock to lead your eye in all the way up to that distant sort of layered mountain range in the background and it just looked absolutely fantastic. The next thing is simplicity. So when you're trying to look for this composition, it's really important to think about simplicity in the image. Again, this one that I took in Yosemite with the light and the layers of light is super simple. Now, if I just zoom out um, and, and show you the image that I originally took before I cropped it, then you can see that there's some distracting elements to the bottom left of it. And I wanted to crop those out because I'm concentrating on simplicity. And, and I don't want to have distracting elements in the corners of my image. So in this first point of how to look for a great composition when you arrive at a scene, I've come up with an acronym from these points. <laughs> so you want to focus attention, use that dramatic light, come up with a point of interest, think about the corners, and simplicity is key. So the acronym I came up with for that, sorry about this, is FLIX. Okay, moving on to point two of the top ideas for coming up with great compositions, and that is patterns in the landscape. They're really pleasing on the eye. They give an area in the image for the eye to rest, but they also allow the viewer to slowly move to the point of interest in the image, which might be a mountain in the, in, in the background, as in this image here that I took in Glencoe. You can see that the patterns are repeating in the grasses at the bottom, and although that's a big element of the image, it really draws your eye up into the mountains in the distance, and it also reflects some of the shapes in the mountains as well and that really helps to gel the image together. I've also used patterns in this image as well. So you can see that it's the patterns of the trees that really helps in this image. And we've got these bigger trees in the foreground, but those same patterns in those trees in the foreground, those tr real strong triangular shapes are reflected in the, in the background um, trees as well. And that creates for, again, a really pleasing image. And then those strong diagonal lines from the light coming across really add to the power of this image. So try and look for patterns in the landscape. Okay, the third thing to think about when composing an image is lines and shapes and how those lines and shapes can create effortless movement around the image. So most images have something called visual weight and visual weight is where your eye naturally lands when you look at an image. But what you want to try and do is not just, you know, if you just placed a person in the middle of the image and it was all white, then they just go to the person, you look at the person and then you'd leave the image. What you want to be able to do is use lines and shapes to allow the viewer to just navigate around that image. So they might end up looking at one particular part of the image, but they don't just want to go straight to it. Or if they do go straight to it, they want to be able to then go from it to different elements in the image. So that's why we use things like the S curve and diagonals and leading lines of diagonal lines of walls going through an image. They become really powerful to create that movement through the image. So in this image that I took um, in San Francisco, I was on one of the um, reserves there, looking over, uh, over the Golden Gate Bridge. It's a fairly unique view, actually. Not a lot of people go to that particular location. And I was trying to use the leading lines of the rocks to lead the viewer through the image, through to Tiburon, in the, the, the village of Tiburon and the harbour there in the foreground, and then eventually through to the Golden Gate Bridge. And there's lots of lines in this image that allow the viewer to go down and through the image to the Golden Gate Bridge eventually. And the more you look at this image, the more it tells a story, you can see different things. And when it's printed really big, it looks absolutely fantastic. Another one from San Francisco is this one here, where I've intentionally put the subject, which is the bridge off to the right hand side, and I've used the path to lead the viewer down to the bridge. And then there's another diagonal line that leads you through to the city in the background. And again, I'm using the shapes, the triangles within this image and the shapes to lead the viewer through the image. The fourth top tip and something that is so important because it's, it, it's why most images don't work. And that is moving from 3D, as you see it with two eyes here, you've got stereo vision and, and, and obviously that allows you to create a 3D image to a 2D image when you get back and see it in Lightroom or print it out. 
Now what often happens when you go to a location and you see is that you have peripheral vision, you have like a wide angle of vision, but you're walking around, you're, you're, you're moving around. So as you're moving around that, that location, things are changing in the foreground compared to the background and you're seeing the vast landscape as it is. And, and that allows your brain to interpret the image very differently than when you take it in two dimensions. So what you're trying to do as a photographer is take that 3D image and turn it into 2D to be able to tell that story and create the feeling of when you were there. So the first thing is snow. I'll just go out and, and, and now it's snowing outside. I'll just show you quickly how you can do that. So texture in images is really important, but often it's really difficult to do that when you have no light. But one of the things that snow does for you is it accentuates that texture in the trees. So if we just come and have a look at this tree, which I'm just about to photograph now, it just looks really great. So if you can just see there, there's the texture on that tree, and I'll zoom in and I'll, I'll get a bit closer in a minute so you can see it in, in, in a different shot. But the texture on that tree just looks fantastic. But not only have you got texture on the trees, but the snow allows you to see the 3D shape of that image. And that's what light does again really well. As the light shines on the side of that branch, then you get a 3D shape and you, it allows you to see something a little bit more in three dimensions. Because obviously when you're seeing it on the screen, it's two dimensions. And that's exactly what's happened here. That snow is giving you texture and form, which is massively adding to the composition and making the picture so much more interesting. The other thing that often goes wrong, and this is especially true in woodland photography, is that all your um, trees just become compacted together. Again, if you think about it, if you're walking around in a, in a forest, as you're going across and moving across the trees and moving in front of the trees, then the background trees are moving at a different rate than the foreground trees and you get that 3D image in your brain and it looks really amazing. When you do that in 2D and just take an image of it, you can't see that. So what you've got to do is use nature to help you out. So fog is the best way of doing that. So you can see two images here. One is Got, it's got one of the elements, I've got snow on the, on the, on the branches, um, so that you can see the form of the branches, but this image of the same location has got fog as well, and it really helps to create layers in the image that then draws your eye through the image and gives that 3D nature to the image, and you, you feel more like you were there, and you can understand more how the forest disappears into the background. What fog also does is gets rid of the light and dark areas in the image a lot more because it creates a more uniform background canvas. To show another one, this is Bleetarn, which you've probably seen before. Um, and the reason this works is that there are layers in the image. So there's the foreground, which is the, the water dropping on the, on the lake here. Then there is the midground, which is the tree, but then that's separated from the background from the rainbow. So there's the far midground, which is that first hill, and then that's separated from the ground behind it from the fog. And because we've got those layers in the image, your brain sort of builds up a three-dimensional view of that picture. And you can sort of imagine being there more. It, it, it just creates a more dynamic image. So number five is tell a story. Okay, you can have a little bit of tea. If you think about an image in a photo and why you're, you're taking it, then you're trying to convey to the viewer the mood, the feeling, and you're trying to tell a story of when you were there. So these are two images that, again, I've shown quite a lot of time, but really great images that, that, that I'm really, really proud of don't come along that often. They, they are, without doubt, difficult to, to, to shoot. And the you know, first one is the River Brathay one that I took on that amazing foggy morning when you, know, you probably saw me take my drone up in the air and it was just stunning. It was just at the end of autumn when winter was coming, the tree, the trees are still laden with this glorious, colourful leaves. The mist rising from, from the river in the foreground. The sheep in line just going through in the, in the distance between the trees here. The other image, and by a long way has been my most popular print that I've, I've sold, is this one um, at Blue Tarn with this rainbow. I think everything came together on this. I've just spoke to it previously about the layers and creating that 3D effect and your eye wanders around it, you can see the rock detail in the background when you really start to study the image. Now, how do you go about telling that story? Well, obviously, you know, the way that you compose your images can have a really good element of that, making sure you have balance to your images. But you can also use tricks like using color in your images to tell a story. So this image that I took whilst I was in the Alps a few years ago, 
shows how color really helps. So this is the image in black and white. I want to show you in black and white before I show you the color version. And the black and white is an okay image, but as soon as you add color to this image, it becomes a completely different story. And you can see that it's, you know, it's got a real cold feeling to it, apart from the little bit of sun that's just rising here in the top of these peaks. It makes it look like these peaks are really magnificent and towering above everything else in the valley, which is really cold in, 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 in the foreground. Okay, my sixth, 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 my sixth tip is about using negative space and having the subject a long way off center or smack bang in the center. So just doing something a little bit different, really. An example of just negative space is this image that I took in the out. The subject is smack bang in the middle of the image. So what I've done is I've used diagonals that are created from the mountain to draw your eye straight away into the peak of the mountain. I've placed it right in the middle of the image. But with a strong composition like that, then it's quite often to have quite to have some negative space. So the negative space that I created is the sky. The sky adds everything to the image because it allows you just to rest your eye in that, in that bit above. And that contrast between that negative space and the, and the real crispness of the sky and the mountain and the real soft clouds at the bottom really create a very, very powerful image. Using negative space or placing subjects right at the edge of the image, you can create super powerful images like this one that really re reflect a story or a mood. So I was in Zion National Park um, hiking up something called Angel's Landing. I wanted to just create an idea of how high up I was and the vertical nature of the cl cliffs. So what I've done here is rather than using diagonals, I've used the verticals of the cliffs and those straight up and down lines to create a real sense of drama where you just go dr almost drop into the image and then this tiny car at the right place right at the bottom and this negative space above it to create real real drama to the image. Okay, the seventh tip is don't allow the viewer to leave the image easily or get distracted. It's simplicity really, coming up with simplicity. So I'll show you an image that doesn't work. So this is an image that I took when I was showing about form on trees and how important that is. But this image doesn't work because of the vertical lines of the trees behind that are too close in exposure to the tree in the foreground. So you sort of, it becomes one mess and you get distracted by the vertical lines in, in the background. This image here that I took shows that in a much better way um, because there's fog in between and it creates layers to the image which gives it a 3D nature, but also it stops you getting distracted by those vertical lines in the background. Finally, this, this is an image that I took on my, on my final day in the Alps recently, and I was skiing down, it was just really a snapshot that I, I, I took with my Fuji F X-T2. And after I got it back into Lightroom, this is a rare occasion where I think, actually there's a real good shot within this shot. So I cropped right in into the shot and, cr and then created a really powerful shot that wasn't there in the original shot because there was lots of distracting elements to it. So maybe a good idea that you might find that since some of your images with these really high megapixel cameras that you can crop in a little bit tighter and find some really great images in, in the ones that you've already got. <sighs> okay, so a lot to take in I'm sure, <laughs> but there's, how I go about composition. Okay, thanks a lot for watching. If you have enjoyed this video, then I've nearly finished an ebook on composition, which I've been working on for probably six months now. <laughs> so it's taken a while. Um, and I'm gonna be sending that, the link out to that to anybody that's signed up for my newsletter. So if you haven't signed up for my newsletter, there's a link below, sign up for it, and you'll get a free um, ebook on composition when I finish producing it, which will probably be in the next week or so. And if you've enjoyed this video, then please share it. Uh, I really appreciate that. And if you're not subscribed already, then please subscribe, give it a thumbs up and comment below on what you think makes great composition. Okay, until next Sunday, bye. <laughs>